Welcome to Cherry Street Investor Education with Kavita Baratake, passive income coach and founder of Cherry Street Investments. Education that is designed for you to take control of your financial life. Join us to learn how you can create multiple passive income streams, diversify your portfolio, save on your taxes, and much more. Become a better investor and fast track your financial goals. Here's your host, Kavita Baratake. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kavita Bartake, and um, thanks for joining in and spending time with us this evening. We are going to talk about investing in medical office buildings today, and I'm excited to have Dr. Paul Sink with us. Uh, he's an ENT specialist, and I really cannot say auto, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I've tried. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good linguistically. That, that word beats me, so we're going to have to ask it's you tough. again, Dr. Sink, how sure. to say Auto, OT, OT, what? Uh, Oral laryngology. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's what he does. He's a, I, I call it an ENT specialist because I can't say otherwise. Uh, he was in a surgical, has a surgical practice and retired since from his surgical practice. Uh, he's also a principal at Legacy Development and Consulting, has been doing this for 25 years. I don't know how you managed uh, a busy practice with like 60 something people and um, a lot of real estate for the last 25 years. So kudos to you for that. It was so, all because of my wife. It's all because right? of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, you got to do something. I'm sure you spent a lot of time on it. So at least she had the home front, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so always uh, when we put these presentations together, we note that they are educational purposes only and we're not selling anything here today. Uh, we're not selling any uh, deals or it's not a solicitation for a deal. And al always consult your own attorney, financial advisor and CPA for all legal matters, investments and in specific tax situations. A few housekeeping items. Everybody is in mute automatically except Dr. Singh and me. Uh, if you have any issues with audio visual, I've had some issues lately where you're not able to see the visual clearly, uh, please let me know uh, in the chat box so I can see what I can do on my end, which is usually not a whole lot. So hopefully we don't have any issues today. Um, also, please locate the Q&A box in the Zoom application or the browser pop-up and use that Q&A box for asking questions. So it just makes it a lot easier to uh, track. Uh, everybody asks me this and I always keep telling, hey, we'll have the webinar recorded and I'll still get out 10 emails out saying, where's the webinar recording? It will always be on YouTube and I usually post it within 24 hours. Um, if you want to avoid it from going to spam or promotions folder, please add my email to your contact list so that it goes into your right folder so you don't miss the webinar recording link. Um, a quick note about Cherry Street. I don't want to go through all of this. Uh, I do believe that real estate is a long-term way of ge building generational wealth and diversifying investments with tax benefits. Uh, a lot of my investors are exposed, overexposed to stock market investments, and I feel like they do need that diversification in real estate. So my goal is to bring these alternate investments to you and talk about or bring these amazing speakers to you who will talk about different investment strategies, taxation, asset protection, estate planning, and a whole lot of topics. I have over 100 webinars recorded on YouTube if you guys want to go. And I'm sorry, someone decided to run a mower in the back. So if there's any background noise, I apologize. I hope it's not picking up too much. Um, I do provide passive investments in real estate. I personally work on apartment complexes, senior living facilities and land development projects. And I'm also a realtor in the Austin market, although I don't really have the time to do much on that front lately. Um, I'm also running a business on um, high cash value, structuring high cash value, life insurance policies and what's called premium financing. And people use this as a tool to invest into real estate. So if you're interested on that, there are some webinars on the YouTube channel. Uh, I also have a Facebook investor group if you're interested in joining called the Purely Passive Investor Group. Um, this is my YouTube channel. So please go there if you don't mind, subscribe and you can see a whole bunch of information there on different topics. Uh, the link is bit.ly cherry hyphen street. 
So upcoming webinars, we have a real estate economic update with Kathy Fetke. Uh, she is a real estate investor out of LA and um, she runs a company called Real Wealth, uh, Real Wealth. And she's just always on TV talking about economic updates. So I had a pleasure of meeting Kathy recently and invited her to speak on my webinar. So that'll be June 20th, uh, 30th. Um, also, we'll, we'll talk about senior living investments. I'll probably do that topic since I'm working a lot on senior living lately. Uh, passive investor due diligence. It's, this is an important one if you're a passive investor. So you can learn about how to do your due diligence before you invest in a passive um, deal. Uh, what kind of questions you need to ask your sponsor or what kind of, I've done one, one of these before, but Ashley Wilson, she's a multifamily investor, brings a wealth of knowledge in this space. Uh, she works with Jay Scott, uh, of bigger pockets. So they are a team and they work together. So she's going to be on to talk about due diligence and how you can dot your I's and cross your T's with uh, passive investments you do. And if you have any other topic suggestions that will be useful to you, please let me know. And I usually, most of the webinars are every other Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. Central Time. So please invite you to uh, um, join me and my guest speakers. A little bit about me, I am an immigrant. I came here in 98, graduated with a master's in computer science, had nothing to do with real estate, followed the track every Indian does, um, stayed in tech tech for like 20 years um, across IBM Atlassian. And the last 10 years before I quit, I started investing in real estate. Since the 08 crash and I lost half my 401k in the stock market, I decided I had to do something concrete about it. So I got into real estate, bought a house, scaled up the number of houses I had, got tired of it, got into apartment investments. And then now I'm investing in ATM, senior living, mobile home park, Bitcoin mining funds, and all sorts of the fun, fun things. Um, I also uh, lead uh, investments as a general partner in multifamily land development and new construction, as well as senior living on new construction. Uh, that's my portfolio. We recently, um, last year, sold two properties. We are on contract to sell a couple more this year. So we are in the sell mode and also buying very selectively right now. I'm excited to have Dr. Sink on. So Dr. Sink and I met through a common friend, um, Dr. Teo in Austin. So I was really excited to meet him and actually have him on on a webinar that a two day event we host called Passive Investor Ed. So he came and shared about medical offices there as well. So he's got a lot of experience with real estate investing and also more than 10 years experience in real estate development. Uh, he works with investor relations, lender relations, uh, exploring new markets, as well as corporate governance. And um, over the past 10 years, he co-sponsored more than 30 syndications, uh, exceeding $325 million in value. That's just mind-boggling to me. Um, amazing uh, work. All while he had a practice, uh, a, a busy practice specializing in uh, head and neck surgery again. I'm not going to say that word because <laughs> I can't. <laughs> um, for nearly 30 years, and uh, he has his own independent surgical practice with 10 providers and 60 employees. I hats off to you, Dr. Singh, for doing all that. Um, and I think he recently retired. Is that right, Dr. Singh? Yes, yes. He's retired a few months now. Yep. Yeah. From so, surgery. <laughs> from surgery. So you still manage something? In the well, we, I still no, no, uh, just manage our, our investments with real estate. So, gotcha. So, you're retired from medicine, yes. Officially. Yep, okay. Officially. okay, that's awesome. So, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to him, and I think we're just gonna keep this um, very casual. There'll be no presentation here specifically, so we're just gonna let Dr. Singh um, share his wealth of knowledge in the medical office space. And then please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A box. So if there are any questions, we'll, we'll take them as we go along. Over sure. to you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Kavitha, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, Kavitha has done such a phenomenal job on her end as well, having uh, these webinars and uh, um, her uh, cadre of uh, investors and all that she does. She does a phenomenal job with that as well. 
Um, so maybe just a, a little bit of introduction, I guess. You saw that little intro. Um, uh, I have been in uh, a head and neck surgeon ENT for about 30, 31 years. Um, for those people in Texas, I did my training at Baylor College of Medicine. I went to medical school there and then um, went to UT Southwestern in Dallas for my surgical uh, 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 training, uh, a couple of years of general surgery in the four of ENT. Um, and so then went north and did my private practice there. So, um, and then about 25 years ago, I also on the side got into some real estate and started buying a few things and um, you know just doing some uh, stuff with our family company. And about 12 years ago now, I joined a partner to start a development company. And now we do real estate development. And um, Kavitha has showed our, 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 our portfolio of, of projects and what we've done. And it's been a, it's been a blast to, to, to do all of that. Um, so, and, and part of all of that is I was also been fortunate enough to be involved with a surgical hospital which is a physician owned surgical hospital. And so I was part of the governance of that again for about 25 years. And the last 15 years of my practice, I was the uh, chairman of the board. So able to uh, see the governance of the surgical hospital, we had an ambulatory care center and urgent care, um, all of that. And so um, that sparked my interest, of course, a lot into the medical real estate a portion of that. And so I kind of lead that with our, with our companies that we have. Um, so the good news um, that I have to report tonight is that medical office uh, in 2022 is still very strong. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, um, there was a lot of concerns at that time, a lot of concerns about telehealth and virtual visits. And would that uh, decrease the space for uh, medical office? Uh, just like general office, right? I mean, so general office uh, is a tough investment these days. You don't know what's going on there. Uh, you, a lot of people are talking about hybrid work. And if you work for Elon Musk, he's going to make you come and work in his, in his uh, office uh, no matter what. So uh, right. he announced general office uh, is it yesterday. going to make you come and work in I'm getting a little bit. Uh, yeah, there we go. But anyway, uh, so... Uh, the medical office piece and the virtual visits um, uh, has not been the threat that we thought it was. Um, so prior to the pandemic, telehealth and virtual visits were probably about two to three percent of all uh, medical care. During the pandemic, uh, at its height, probably quarter two of 2020, it was about 52 percent of all visits were uh, telehealth. And then now uh, kind of consider ourselves being in the post-pandemic, uh, we are at about 11% of all visits are uh, telehealth. Um, and we really think that telehealth actually has increased the efficiency of uh, medical care. Um, you know, we think that that actually leads or results in more inpatient visits. Um, we think that actually it has created better medical care for patients. Uh, we think that uh, it seems to patients are keeping up with their doctors better. Um, they're able to call in, do a virtual visit and not have to go six months or a year before they recheck their labs or recheck their health or change in a medication or something like that. So um, we really think it's actually will turn out to be a much better efficient way of, of uh, delivering healthcare. Uh, so with all of that, um, we do think that medical uh, office building investments are very durable. Uh, it's gone, we've gone through, uh, I went through as a practicing physician back in 2008 with the recession, and I was waiting for everything to stop. But of course, patients still need their health care, right? And so they still continue with that. It's one of those durable things in our, in our lives that we really have to do uh, on an ongoing basis. And so that leads to um, uh, the great durability of, of, of the medical office building investments. Um, we also think that because of the medical office and the tenants involved uh, being very stable and long-term tenants, uh, that it's great for the conservative investor. Um, cash flows are stable. Typically there are uh, known rents for the next 
five, 10, 15 years. There are typically escalators uh, with those rents uh, every year. And so it's very predictable what your investment is going to be with a very stable tenant. When a, when a physician or a physician group establishes their place in town, that they, that's where you get your pediatric care, that's where your ER is, they don't tend to move around very much. It's a big investment to uh, start a medical practice with all of the equipment and that sort of thing, even dentist's office, those kinds of things. They just don't move around a lot that maybe a, a, an attorney office would move around or some other office uh, would move. And so you've got a stable long-term tenant typically. The other thing that we learned uh, during the pandemic um, was this concept of a convenient location. So we found out that patients really don't wanna travel for medical, for medical care greater than 30 minutes. That seems to be the, the, the cutoff. Um, so medical office buildings are best served in the community, in the residential living areas. And you'll see uh, large hospital systems place their medical office in the residential areas closer to the patient. Um, that seems to have been a more of important factor for patients uh, as opposed to even quality of the facility. So some good studies were done in, in, in that regard. Um, as a caveat to that, urban locations, uh, urbanites are a little bit more prefer maybe telehealth. Suburban locations, they want that convenient location. So um, those are great places to invest in. So you've got minute clinics, urgent cares, and that sort of a thing. Um, so those are great investments because uh, if they are located more uh, closer to the patient. Um, the other major factor with healthcare in general, as you all probably can imagine, is that um, two major factors have come out of the pandemic. One is that obviously our population is getting older. So uh, medicine, healthcare, obviously is not going away that, uh, and, and is increasing all the time as our population increases in age. The other thing that happened during uh, COVID and the pandemic was that we felt that there was patients actually have a better healthcare awareness now. And so people are you know, afraid of getting that second or third COVID uh, 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 infection. Um, and it actually, in general, studies have shown that patients now are a little more healthcare aware. Uh, they're probably seeing their physician a little bit better. They're keeping up with their medications better and all of that. So you know, increasing elderly population, better healthcare awareness. Uh, again, this will create a high demand for healthcare in general and for MOBs, as we call them. Um, so uh, the fact that um, MOBs are such a stable investment obviously leads to the fact that uh, uh, we do want to continue to, to invest in, in, in MOBs. Um, there have been a couple of trends in healthcare um, as reported here in, in 2022. Um, again, we talked about this a little bit, uh, more outpatient sectors, outpatient facilities. Those are things to look for to invest in. Um, these have translated into more opportunities for investors, developers, and providers themselves. The other big trend, of course, as we talked about was telehealth. It now has become an integral part of delivering care, but really only about 11% of all medical visits. Um, in the medical office buildings themselves, uh, the construction or rehabilitation renovations of those buildings, they are creating more flexible exam rooms uh, and also more flexible telehealth rooms. So they're putting that into the construction and that's something that is coming into the new construction of a lot of um, medical buildings. Um, well, obviously rural patients uh, want to have more access to their specialists in urban centers 
That's another part of the uh, uh, of telehealth and obviously their greater access to care. The other big trend that seems to be happening in, in medicine in general and in the medical office space is behavior health. So we are being uh, hopefully more aware of, of, of our mental health. Uh, some reports are saying that mental health, behavior health is really affecting about a quarter of all Americans. Um, the stigma is decreasing uh, to undergo healthcare with a behavioralist or mental health uh, a provider. Um, and so uh, that is another part of that. Behavior, some behavior health, some psychiatric care can be given uh, via uh, uh, telehealth, but uh, they are building more, investing more into that. In fact, more institutional investors are now looking more into the behavioral health facilities. Dr. Singh, with the behavioral health, do you see it going more online, like Zoom calls and stuff, than, if, than the traditional medical care? It, it, it can be, and, I, and that 11% that I talked about is in general uh, medical visits. I would assume, I don't have a number for you, but I would assume that mental health, behavioral health, uh, telehealth is, is higher than that. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, the good thing is that more money is being placed into that, more awareness. And as I said, the institutional investors actually are becoming more interested in more behavioral health facilities. So is that still affecting real estate in a real way, Big meaning that these behavioral health specialists, do they still need offices and uh, facilities to do mm -hmm. their practice or are they just working from home? Well, um, as a summary, I was going to say that, you know, you can do a lot of things virtual, right? I mean, you can do a lot of virtual banking. You can do a lot of virtual uh, uh, medical care. You can do a lot of those types of things. But when it gets right down to the nitty gritty and when you want specific care, you want to figure out exactly where you are. You want to meet your professional in person. And yeah. so um, you're obviously preparing for a surgery or those kinds of things. But in those more critical behavior health visits, again, I think in person is where most patients want to be. Makes sense. Um, so as far as other trends in healthcare, uh, we talked about the outpatient opportunities, uh, both suburban and urban markets. Um, and as far as regionally, the Sun Belt is the is the king, right? Uh, Sun Belt is the area to be in. Austin, Miami, Phoenix; those are the areas where um, a lot of healthcare facilities are, are are going. Obviously, the populations are moving in those areas, and um, that's where uh, most of the uh, healthcare facilities uh, and investments are. The other metrics of some of these locations are, you know, population, uh, age employment, growth, you're looking at, you're looking at a lot of job growth, where, where is that happening? That's happening in Sunbelt, of course. Cost of doing business and investor sentiment. So um, again, those locations I mentioned, plus others, uh, it seems to be heading uh, in, in those directions. Um, one concern that seems to be happening more uh, and, and I would say would be more of a, of a risk um, is what's happening in a lot of real estate right now. And that is the financing and that is increased rent or increased uh, uh, rates. So the threats to MO for, to medical office buildings, as we talked about is virtual care, healthcare, but that's really, again, kind of stabilized at about that 11% area. Um, COVID um, affects healthcare in the fact that it's not that doctors, nurses, providers can't handle it necessarily. I mean, they, they were very uh, overwhelmed at first. Uh, they can do the work, but now like a lot of other industries, it's, it's a labor issue so that there's, there's maybe less workers at uh, a hospital or at a clinic less maybe number of nurses or, or aides or, or uh, 
uh, other helpers. It's kind of like a restaurant, right? I mean, you've seen the change in restaurants where uh, there's not as many uh, waitresses, there's not as many service uh, going on. And, you know, um, and so uh, uh, it, it's the same thing in healthcare. Um, and it's something that is we probably all have to get used to a little bit. Um, uh, and, and the workers themselves are, are getting sick. And so, and they have time off. So that's how COVID has affected uh, healthcare as well. And going back to the rents uh, and the, uh, the, the rates, um, right now, a lot of sellers, I think uh, my experience has been that they do think it's 2018 still, and they'd still want to sell their buildings at very low caps. And, uh, but there's the, the, the problem with a lot of that is that the rents have not increased along with the interest rates for the loans. And so um, some of these rents uh, are too low for the financing. They can't support uh, the DSC, DSCRs. Uh, and so the financing, it gets pretty squeezed. And so if you're paying uh, all of your money for uh, out of your NOI for the building, for your uh, loan uh, rate, which is higher, there's less there for the investors and less there for the, for the owners and developers. So that's kind of an issue and a problem I, I see happening right now. And, um, you know, the bankers are kind of throwing their hands up and other people. So um, what's the fix for that or the cure is going to be obviously more on an economic uh, factor. So rents have to increase. Uh, another possible fix is the purchase price uh, has to come down or the cap rates have to go up. Um, and sometimes in some of these uh, situations, the only person that can buy some of these buildings in this regard is an all cash buyer. Mm -hmm. So that's how things are shaken out. So are you um, seeing that shift in rents and uh, cap rates already, or is that something that you think is still not happening in the Sun Belt states? Um, I, I think we're right at the cusp, Kavita. I think it's happening right now. I mean, I was on the phone today, I think I was telling you earlier, with three different lenders today uh, for a wonderful medical office building, mm -hmm. uh, great tenants, long-term lease, 15-year uh, lease, triple net, all, all of the factors involved, but the rates are just too high to support their current rents. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's difficult. And this is some of the first times I'm seeing that. And so it, it, I think it's happening right now. And so some of that shift and some of that cure that I was talking about is going to start to have to happen in the next, you know, the latter part of 2022. So do you recommend people wait until it happens or? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I just want everybody, I want everybody to be aware. Uh, that's really certain. And you're probably seeing that in your other investments as well with other sectors. Um, it's there. Uh, I still think obviously medical office is extremely stable, long-term, great uh, conservative investment. Um, so if you can find properties in that regard and you can still get good prefs and, and, and all of that's, that's still good. It's still a good investment. But right. I think you just have to be ask your developer uh, about these, these interest rates and uh, so that they don't get caught in the middle of this and then the investor gets caught. Right. And uh, for the viewers who don't know what a triple net is, can you just tell them quickly? So one of the one of the great things too about a, a medical office building is the fact it's called, it's called triple net or net, net, net. Um, type of a lease. And so what that means is that as the, the, for the owner in a true triple net lease, the owner is really only responsible probably for the roof and the foundation. Um, and that can be just about it. Uh, so all other factors, all of the utilities, all, all of the other issues inside the building, all of the furniture and fixtures, all of the flooring, all of that sort of a thing is all on the, on the tenant. Uh, there is something called an absolute triple net. And that means the owners are really responsible for nothing. And so I've seen a few of those deals. So not even the roof and the foundation. Uh, so that's great to have that triple net. It's 
very typical in medical office building to have triple net. And again, is one of the great features uh, mm -hmm. about that investment. And that includes property taxes and insurance costs as well, both of All which of have skyrocketed in Texas, for example. So exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. great to pass that on to the tenants. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, so one other just factor I want to say about healthcare in, in general, just as it um, uh, relates to real estate, is that healthcare delivery, like a lot of other things in the world, uh, will become more computerized. There'll be more use of robots. We'll be using more, mm -hmm. getting more results and things off our phones and, and mobile, and of course, virtual. Uh, we hope that all of this certainly leads to a better, more efficient healthcare, which I really think that, that, that it will. Um, uh, you can actually check in with your provider more often, as I said before. You can get your lab results, changing medications, all those sort of things will be a lot better with, with that. Um, uh, and, and checking in more often, obviously, to uh, assess your symptoms as well. Um, but as far as the office piece of that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about the hybrid model of general office, and there will be some of that in the uh, medical office space as well. Uh, but as we said before, uh, patients, you will usually prefer for the ultimate consultation to be in person. Uh, and you would want that with all of your other professional advisors as well. Um, so, so maybe big takeaways that I have for you tonight is that medical office buildings are still very stable, strong, dependable investment. They've got a great future. Uh, we do have an increasing uh, age in our population, and that will continue uh, to uh, provide need for healthcare in general, of course. There's been a big healthcare awareness, as we've talked about, after the pandemic. Uh, and so patients are typically seeing their providers more. Um, medical office buildings are trending to be more outpatient and outpatient care. And you'll see these kinds of buildings, uh, again, in the general residential areas. And this con uh, concept of a convenient location within the community where patients don't have to travel really more than 30 minutes. Um, is very important. All right. I think we have some questions so we can sure. start doing some Q&A. Uh, we have one question here from Dr. Ozude. Sorry if I butchered your name. What is your outlook on possible financial challenges for this MOB real estate investments as the insurance company landscape becomes more of a headwind to the facility or the providers? I guess he's dealing with that. You know, um, I have to say in my career, we've been dealing with insurance the whole time and, and insurance has always been a headwind. Uh, uh, I, I, I just think that, that we will have to continue on with healthcare the way it is. I, 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 I think we've tried the government model and there's going to be some hybrid of that, but I don't think that the government model of insurance is going to take over everything as we thought a few years ago. So I think there's still going to be some private insurance. So that's still going to be happening. Um, and I, I think we're just going to have to deal with it and, and continue on. I, I don't think there's it's leaning one way or the other at all. Uh, so. So you don't see any major health care reform? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I mean, make it easier and better for patients and doctors. No, no yeah. Well, again, that's been tried so many times and, with the government and everybody. And so I, I think that uh, people know that that can't get passed in Congress uh, efficiently. And so I, I think we're gonna stay where we are for a while. Yeah. So um, in terms of leases for the triple net leases, what are the typical leases and how are the, the escalation structured into the lease typically that you see? Sure. So. Uh, um, Again, the nice thing about medical office is that you know the rents and you calculate them out over years. Um, one of the great things about the leases, typically with medical office, is, is their longevity. So typically, it, you know, five-year leases is a short lease for 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 medical office. You typically like ten or fifteen. I've seen twenty-year le leases as well, and so it was typically all about the leases and all that sort of thing that you get these long-term leases, stable cash flow. And again, depending on your investment strategy, whether you're a cash flow person um, or, or you, you like uh, appreciation or how, how you want to do that, 
uh, I think a lot of people really love the cash flow, of course, and that's probably the priority. So that's what these, these investments provide. Um, and, but on top of that now, these rents have come to the fore and that, that the rents have been typically pretty low uh, and, and, and they are low compared to the rates of interest rates that a person borrowing money to buy these has to pay. Uh, so that's, that's the issue. Um, so, so it's almost favorable to actually find medical offices where the tenants are maybe towards the end of the lease. That way you can retrade and pu push up the rents. A good, good point. A good question. Uh, typically you, we've always thought about being on the front part of that lease so that you have that longevity, right? So right. now what are interest rates going to do? I mean, who's got the crystal ball to know, uh, we do know that probably the Fed is going to increase rates here uh, by uh, an entire point the next time and maybe another point. So at least we think it's going to go up a couple of points. And then will they come down? And the, the coming down will be pretty pretty gradual, most likely. So another way of doing some of these, uh, the financing is possibly doing a floating rate. So you get a floating rate, which is maybe Wall Street Prime plus, I was quoted today, Wall Street Prime plus zero. So it was like at 4%. So that's great. But, you know, in July, are they going to increase? And in, in September, are they going to increase again? So we could be up at 6% on that, on that deal uh, versus maybe a 10-year lock-in at 5 or something like that. And uh, what typical cap rates are you seeing? Let's say like McKinney, what kind of cap rates are you seeing right so now? McKinney, the, those cap rates are, uh, uh, I'm seeing them at the low fives. Okay. You know, five and a quarter, that yeah. sort of thing. There's not uh, much spread there. There's not much spread there. And so, you know, we were trying to do some pro forma today about, so if, if we're paying a five, five and a quarter and the, the rates are good, the cap rates are going to increase to five, seven, five in two years, three years, then, you know, we've, we've lost that. So uh, we want them to go down for, for the, for the sale. So, it's tough right now. It's, it's tough right now, to, and, uh, honestly, and, and to, to look at where, where you need to be. Are, are a lot of people retrading? Do you see retrades happening already? I don't. I don't. I, 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 I think that I, I'm seeing some sellers who are probably not realistic at where they, where they want to be. And so, They're like still coming off the COVID high. <laughs> exactly, exactly. As I said before, and so they think that that's going to happen. But I think what's going to happen is they're going to get less and less offers, mm -hmm. un unless you're a person that wants to take a gamble or pay some stupid money. Um, so, um, yeah. Is there stupid money coming in? Like we had stupid money coming in from institutional, you know, funds and buyers just throwing money at it. Is that slowing down? I think it's slowing down. Uh, but, you know, I think in all cycles, to be honest with you, it could be, I think there's stupid money. You know, there's people who just, just do it anytime. They just want the product. They yeah. want to buy that asset no matter what. And then, and then they, you know, might suffer later mm -hmm. or, or, or not do as well as they, they, they could have or should have. Got it. Got it. And um, I think I have one more question. Do you see that, I know during COVID, a lot of people who needed follow-ups didn't go. I was one of them. I didn't go to the doctor for two years. I'm like, if I don't need to see them, I don't need to see them, right? Uh, <laughs> do you see a catch-up of that happening uh, post-COVID? Like since yes. now we are, yeah. And that's the good part of telehealth, right? And so mm -hmm. you're, you're catching up, you're, you're, you're following up with patients. I have to tell you a personal story. I had a patient uh, during COVID who had a head and neck cancer and uh, was not following up. And he ended up actually having a heart attack oh and, and, and during this, that time, during the COVID time and was not following up with his doctor at all. And it, there were signs of that early on and, 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 and the poor patient had a, had a natural outcome there. It was, it was too bad. Uh, but that happened during that time. And that's where we feel that telehealth will probably uh, increase the quality of the care for follow-ups. All, right. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, we're going to let Dr. Sink go. And um, uh, any other questions? You can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat box. All right. 
I think we have a pretty quiet audience. So thank you so much, Dr. Singh, for <laughs> sharing you, all the insights with us and um, have a great evening. Thank, thank you, you everyone for joining. Thanks everyone. Hi, I'm Kavita Bartake. I hope you found this video useful. And if you did, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can get notified of any future videos I upload. I plan to cover a lot of investor education on this channel, and I hope you'll stay with me for it. If you have any feedback on future content you'd like to see me cover, please drop me a note or a comment on my video. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me.